Welcome everyone to um, today's Ask the Author session with my colleague uh, Alexandre Santacreu, who's the lead author of our report on big data for travel demand modeling. Um, good to have you all here. Um, uh, Ask the Author, our 30 minute session is very quick. Uh, we'll have a 10 minute presentation and then you will have the opportunity to quiz our author um, to dig a little deeper, either on things you've uh, uh, you were thinking about when you were reading the report or because you want to find out whether it's worth reading. Um, I encourage you to ask questions via the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of the screen, the Q&A button. The chat's disabled, but you can start to pack in your questions immediately right now uh, or later. I will then pass them on to, to our author. Um, we'll also, at the end of the session, take a quick poll just with two questions. If you can answer those, that would be great. That'll help us to uh, improve this format and make sure that we're on the right track and we're doing something that is actually of value to you. Um, so big data and travel demand modeling. Uh, demand modeling is a hellish business. It's very difficult. It's fraught with uncertainties. Uh, it's not easy at all, but it's hugely important to make the right investment decisions and the right operative decisions as well. Um, so the question is, with all those huge amounts of data out there collectively known as, uh, as um, big data, can we improve the system? Uh, as I think Einstein said, uh, predictions are always difficult, particularly when they're, they're, they concern the future. But with better data, it should be better able to make, we should be able to get better decisions if we use them in the right way. That's what this report was looking at. And it's a great pleasure to hand over to my colleague, uh, Alex, to take us through the findings of the report and then to uh, go through the Q&A with you. Thank you. Alex, over to you. Thank you, Michael. Thank, and thank you all for, for joining us today. Uh, so as Michael said, I, I'll be taking you through the main findings of this report. I will also explain what recommendations we make for the sensible use of big data in transport models. So this new report is the outcome of an ITF roundtable that involved many experts from actually 28 different organizations. Um, it also draws from uh, four discussion papers that uh, you can find on the ITF website and that provide practical illustrations of uh, the use of big data from mobile signals, from smartphones and smart cards in transport planning. Uh, the papers of those the, the, sorry, the authors of those papers are listed here. There is Patrick Bonnell, Norbert Brendel, Iman Esadek and Thibaut Janik, and Louis Williamson. Uh, the report also builds on earlier research uh, conducted by an ITF working group on big data. Uh, many ITF member countries had contributed to it, and we are very grateful for that. Um, Patricia Hu, uh, who is the director of the Bureau of Transportation Statistics at the USDOT, has chaired both the working group and the more recent roundtable, uh, ensuring legacy and consistency across the pieces of work. So let's dive into the subject matter. Uh, I'm sure you all want to know if big data from mobile phones and other sources can help transport planners um, forecast travel demand. The fact is that planners already use big data to complement traditional sources. Uh, here you see the Spanish Transport Ministry, for instance, that has a live mobility dashboard using mobile network data. Um, big data helps understand and forecast travel demand by estimating how many trips uh, people make, uh, to which destination they travel, and which mode or combination of modes they use. Uh, I'll start simply with the identification of three to four sorts of big data. Mobile network data is what uh, mobile network operators know about, about the position of a mobile phone or any mobile device. For instance, uh, they know whether a device is nearby a cell tower. Uh, such data is particularly well suited for the analysis of uh, medium to long distance trips. Uh, smartphone app data is the location data collected by smartphone apps, uh, most often using GPS. Such data offer higher uh, spatial accuracy than mobile network data, 
and uh, they are more likely to infer transport mode to capture short distance trips uh, and to uh, detect short activities. Uh, both data sources, mobile network and smartphone app, um, offer nearly door-to-door -door, uh, tracking, regardless of the transport mode you take, unlike vehicle telematics and smart card data. So compared to traditional uh, data sources, uh, the promptness of big data is helpful because it narrows the gap between data collection and the forecast horizon. It also facilitates the analysis of emerging trends uh, and learn from quasi experiments and exceptional situations such as the one created by a global pandemic. Another positive aspect of big data is its high sample size. Uh, and also the continuous sampling that captures seasonal, daily, weekly uh, variability in, in travel. Uh, I'll, and I'll develop the negative aspects over the next few slides. So the, the private sector collects much of the big data that is relevant to transport planners. It is therefore critical to establish the right partnerships between the private and the public sector. Also critical is the question of privacy protection. Uh, it is often cited as the main barrier to data sharing. Um, another major concern with big data is whether it is representative or biased. That question is often poorly documented and so uh, very difficult to assess. Um, introducing technical standards could reduce the complexity and cost of sharing big data. Uh, the standards would make it easier for transport planners to merge data from several uh, mobile network operators, for instance. However, standards could also hinder innovation uh, because we are in a rapidly changing context. Data collection depends on technologies that are heterogeneous across, across the industry. Uh, so views are mixed. Perhaps our key message uh, to take away is that Big data can complement traditional travel surveys, but it cannot replace them yet. The analysis of vast amounts of data uh, can provide answers to new questions in transport planning, but often does not capture the social demographics information that household travel surveys do capture, uh, and that is critical to the forecast of travel demand. So on this basis, we make seven recommendations for the sensible use of big data in transport models. I'll take you through them quickly. Uh, first, the public sector should follow two principles to protect private and commercial data. Purpose specificity, it ensures that data is collected for the purpose of a precise regulatory task. Data minimization gives preference to the lightest possible data collection mechanism. And uh, the report goes on to, uh, to present data collection as not something that, sorry, data protection as not something that prevents the sharing of big data. Uh, the report proposes that stakeholders acquire and deploy techniques to make data sharing perfectly compatible with privacy protection. Such techniques include aggregation, pseudonymization, encryption, impact assessments, just to mention a few. Stakeholders should also consider uh, something called the safe answers approach, in which no raw data is exchanged, uh, but precise query results can. Our second recommendation is that authorities develop and revise transport modeling guidelines. That's to encourage more use of big data where that is relevant. Uh, the guidelines should be country specific. This is to account for local survey data formats, uh, but also to account for national legal requirements. Uh, you must be aware that many smartphones, uh, smartphone apps collect your location data after they secure consent for it. Those apps include um, on-demand transport and ticketing apps, dedicated travel survey apps, uh, journey planners, and a galaxy of apps that trade 
uh, your mobility data against a free service. You may not be using the same app all day. So how can different apps together paint a complete picture of your trips uh, and activities throughout the day? Uh, this is possible thanks to the marketing ID. It's a unique identifier found on your device uh, and that apps can read. Uh, companies exist that aggregate data from various apps uh, using precisely that marketing ID. Uh, but Apple are working to make it harder for apps to see this ID. Uh, and this is just one example. This is in fact an industry trend towards greater privacy protection. Uh, and that trend could bar access to the kind of data that governments need for planning purposes. So we recommend that smartphone ecosystems continue uh, letting apps collect precise location data where, of course, where the apps secure user consent. Uh, household travel surveys, uh, as I said earlier, remain uh, a pillar of transport planning. These are essential to collect social demographic, behavioral and attitudinal information. Uh, so transport planners should develop uh, a roadmap for maintaining and further improving the quality of household travel surveys. Uh, the roadmap should acknowledge that response rates decline. The roadmap should reflect the potential for data fusion with uh, other sources, uh, big data sources, such as ticketing, mobile phone signal, and smartphone app data. And future household travel surveys should also leverage uh, the power of mobile devices. Survey respondents um, could use dedicated smartphone apps to track and annotate their trips. Apps using motion uh, sensors and precise location services could capture trip details and reduce the burden that is put on respondents uh, that we often ask to record trip diaries. Mobile phone signal and smartphone sensors produce raw data, not information. So we need algorithms that infer trip details from the raw data. That is a very difficult task. And uh, research funding uh, should support the development of such algorithms in which AI could play a major role. Universities could um, organize competitions to make uh, AI uh, algorithms uh, more accurate, transparent, uh, and to create uh, trust and acceptance for it. The University of Sussex Huawei Locomotion Challenge uh, is a good example. The challenge invites researchers to identify different modes of transport uh, from the sensor data collected by smartphones. The person you see here uh, carries four devices when moving around uh, the transport system to collect uh, the annotated data set that underpins the competition. Those data sets are precious. Without it, it's hard to expect uh, rapid progress in this field of research. Um, the report recommends that both uh, public and private organizations designate individuals or teams who proactively initiate, facilitate, and coordinate data sharing partnerships. These are called data stewards. They will initiate pilots, uh, scale them up, promote the exchange uh, and the reuse of data in the public interest, and they will protect potentially sensitive information. Um, our last uh, recommendation is here. Um, privacy protection, data governance, and technical questions require uh, expertise that is rarely found in government. So we recommend that governments recruit big data specialists uh, and train public sector workers in all those relevant skills. Ultimately, authorities must be able to assess uh, data quality and, and say whether uh, it is adequate for a given purpose, just to, to prevent misuse of data. Uh, so these are the seven recommendations from this report. 
um, time for me to, to try and answer your questions. But before, I'd like to give credit to my co-author, Eric Janier, who contributed to this research uh, with much modeling expertise. So back to you, Michael, for the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex. That was very interesting. And uh, kudos to, to Eric, who I see is in the audience. Hi, Eric. Great work. Um, so time for you to uh, put your questions into the Q&A by clicking on, on the icon at the bottom of the screen. Um, I'll, and I'll pass those on. Um, while you're doing that, let me kick it off. That's my privilege as the, as the moderator. I'll get to ask the first question if I want. Because um, I, um, I was very interested by one aspect, which is that a lot of aspects that household surveys actually capture are not captured in big data. And it would seem to me that there, inevitably there's a bias in, in, in big data in some way. Is that a critical um, element? Is it okay to use it? Or how can we counter this, uh, the bias that's probably ingrained in that data? Uh, well, I think it's, it's very important to, to raise awareness on the potential biases. The biases are very hard to measure, to be honest. But big data uh, comes with potentially proportionally very big biases, uh, especially when it is sourced from samples that are not controlled. Um, and uh, unlike in household travel service, because they may underrepresent certain types of households. Uh, for instance, low income households may not have or not use a smartphone. Uh, so is the elderly uh, or some ethnic minorities, who knows? So such uh, some such uncontrolled samples may carry a, a specific socioeconomic or behavioral bias, which could result in a distorted vision of reality, which um, the most complex correction mechanisms uh, may fail to correct or may only partly correct. So the report develops uh, a great number of, of uh, I mean, the report, uh, displays a great number of weaknesses with big data um, to raise awareness on those risks. For instance, if you use a navigation app, if you use app data uh, from a navigation app, do bear in mind that some trip purposes or some, some transport modes may attract uh, a more intense use of that navigation service. But routine trips, walking trips, don't often require navigation services, so they may be underrepresented. Mm. Uh, but to conclude on that point, um, traditional survey data uh, are not free from certain biases either. Um, and, and, and in any way, they are used as evidence to advise policy decisions. Mm. So whether the information comes from traditional surveys or from big data, Input, those inputs are rarely exact and unbiased. So analysts must simply uh, be realistic, pragmatic, and, and seek to minimize those problems as much as they can. Yeah, question of being aware of whatever one deals with in terms of data. Um, I have a question from, from uh, Tito Stefanelli, who's joining us uh, from Italy, who uh, asks uh, this question. In my experience, the cost and availability of this big data is the first barrier to use them. How can we overcome this particular problem? The cost of getting big data. Well, the, the cost, um, um, yeah, because this big data is potentially very powerful. So of course, uh, the owners of that data will try, try to monetize this as far as they can. Mm -hmm. um, and the question for the, for the user, for the transport planner, is whether it would come cheaper as, as an alternative. Uh, the truth is that there is no alternative. It's a new data answering new questions. Um, so the prices will be set by market forces in that, in that example, um, which is why some authorities and some universities are developing apps of their own. Um, and uh, this is this is a great research avenue. Uh, this and this is explored by many researchers. Um, that's what I could say. And availability, uh, yeah. Now, I mean, in some countries, there is uh, a lot of experience with mobile network data. I'm thinking of uh, the UK and Spain. 
uh, in some other countries, there is a lot of experience with smartphone app data. So those things become widely available and they will become more and more so. Uh, the next question is from, from Alex Blackburn from UNICI, a long-standing partner. Hi, Alex. Um, and he's interested in the legal framework that would be required for, for these recommendations. Where are specific legal regulations needed? And for example, would be an update to statistical laws, you know, the, the collection of uh, data collected by the state uh, be necessary? Um, I'm not sure we cover that aspect explicitly in the report. Um, <laughs> Because uh, to be honest, the, the uh, experts in the room acknowledge the, uh, the existence and usefulness of privacy protection laws. Uh, we just have to adapt to it and maybe give, um, uh, give clarity on their interpretation. But I would not necessarily call that a legal framework. Mm -hmm. um, not for now. Um, experts in the round table thought we could we could do with the current framework mm -hmm. and and progress with it maybe a good point to follow up on that is the question of, of things like gdpr of data protection uh, regulation which differs widely between countries and the us you know it's fairly less if there the european union is the the opposite uh, uh, example will that kind of create difficulties and different different speeds and different approaches or um, you know, how far is GDPR helpful and how far is it a hindrance? Yes. So uh, GDPR and the, the US equivalent in California, for instance, um, are very helpful because they reassure um, citizens that their data is uh, well looked after and not misused. Uh, without that trust and confidence from the public, uh, you could have a bigger problem than we have now with, with data collection and statistics. So we find those, those regulations useful, but what's funny is that the interpretation of GDPR is very different from one country to the other uh, within Europe. Uh, so over the next few years, we would appreciate and we recommend that, uh, that uh, privacy protection authorities in every country, provide clarity on the inter on the national interpretation of European law, and it would be good if they could uh, harmonize uh, a little bit their interpretation across countries as well. That's a big task, though. Um, please keep your questions coming. We still have a little bit of time, so uh, this is your opportunity to to quiz Alex um, and uh, draw on, on the report for his answers. Um, I was fascinated by the picture you showed of the guy with the data backpack and many phones. Um, and I think we've all had the experience, most of us, of being ambushed in a bustle train by a guy with a pad and uh, paper and, uh, and um, uh, kind of asking us where we're going and where we're coming. So, and you also mentioned this idea of fusing, um, fusing household surveys uh, with travel surveys with uh, mobile phone apps. And I wonder if there's a practical example that this exists somewhere and what the experience has been actually in having dedicated apps uh, to, to complement uh, household surveys on paper. Um, de dedicated apps to collect, uh, to collect transport data for planning purposes. Yes, there are, there are many, there are dozens. Uh, they are documented in a paper by uh, Pronelli Eyal uh, that we mentioned in the report. Uh, and so that's that's well documented. Uh, mm -hmm. Often, sadly, those apps don't last very long. Uh, I suspect that for an app to be on the uh, app marketplace in an app ecosystem, it needs to be constantly updated to keep up with the new operating systems. Mm -hmm. And that is a cost that, uh, say, a local government or university does not always take into account from, from start. Um, you also asked about data fusion. Um, yes, in, in, the, in the round table, uh, Professor Bonnell showed how uh, mobile network data can be fused with smart card data uh, and household travel survey data. 
Um, and this is a fantastic exercise that raises more questions than it answers. Um, but yeah, it reveals the strengths and weaknesses of each and every source of data and shows how uh, complementary they can be. Talking about mobile networks, um, that technology is also evolving. We're talking about 4G and 5G. Um, are there, what's the potential of developments in that sort of mobile phone sector and, and the network sector for this kind of work traveled in on? So. Right, right. So uh, first, one needs to, to understand uh, that mobile network data only tells which antenna a device connects to. So your phone connects to. We did not hear of any mobile network operator performing any kind of uh, triangulation to accurately pinpoint the location of a phone. So uh, mobile network data puts you in cells and the size of the cell determines the spatial resolution. Um, some, the cell can be the size of a village or a neighborhood uh, typically. So that's what most people know now. Mm -hmm. But what is less known is that cells don't have fixed boundaries, uh, sadly. The truth is that my phone could connect with a, a very remote antenna if the cell I'm in is overloaded, has too much traffic. So um, we need to be careful with uh, mobile network data in terms of spatial accuracy. That spatial accuracy is limited. If your, goal, if your goal is to model long distance travel or long distance commuting, then mobile phone data is perfect. Uh, if your goal is to model all daily trips, including walking and cycling, then mobile network data may not be so helpful. Uh, but experts uh, in, the, in, the meet, in the roundtable meeting uh, reported there was an increase in accuracy thanks to 4G. Uh, and they expect, again, an, an increase in spatial resolution with uh, 5G technology. That's because 5G cells are smaller. They cover a much smaller area. So even though they may have uh, imprecise boundaries, those cells being smaller, you, you know better with more accuracy where mobile phones are in, in a city or in a country. Thank you for that. Um, we're almost uh, reaching the end of our uh, Ask the Alps session today. Um, if there's one more question, I'd be happy to take it and, uh, and uh, overshoot a little bit. Uh, but that question would have to reach me within the next 10 seconds or so while I'm uh, uh, thanking you for your, for your time, for being here. Uh, you saw that little questionnaire popping up. I hope it didn't surprise you too much. And you uh, put your vote on the on the thumbs up uh, side um, it'll help us to really understand what what we can do for you and how we can help uh, the report um, is available on our website for free it doesn't cost anything you can download it um, we're very happy to to uh, engage with you on any questions alex is available eric is available uh, to answer questions and other colleagues as well and um, we have similar work, similar reports on, on big data, on uh, kind of travel, travel demand is one of our big issues, of course. So there's lots of resources on the, on the ITF website. Um, I want to thank you all again. Thank our author, uh, Alex, Eric, from afar, and I hope to see you again at the next Ask the Author. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye.